business as usual on Wednesday night. Okay? Okay, so um, let me just tell y'all a quick little, little story. Uh, I know everybody has kind of seen all of the turmoil and everything that's going on with Waller ISD transportation. No, with buses that have been sitting and parents are angry and all kinds of stuff. And this past week has been just pretty devastating to our department with three of our drivers being uh, let go. And so you couple that with an already shorthanded staff, things have just been really rough. And so each morning when I go in to drive my morning route before I go and do my office job, I have just been praying, just like, Lord, don't, don't allow me to be sucked in to the drama, to all the negativity, to having to know what's going on. Anybody got some itching ears and like to know what's going on? Anybody? Like, it's just in me. Like, I'm trying to put it to death. But when somebody knows something, and I'm like, oh, well, what did you hear? <laughs> That's wrong, right? Like, I should not. Like I, So I've been in prayer, like, Lord, I just, ignorance is bliss in this situation. The less I know, the better. Like, I don't want to know about all of the drama that's happening with this person or with that person and, and all this kind of stuff. So, so I've been praying each morning as I'm driving my, my school bus, like, Lord, just don't let me get sucked into it. Like, if somebody comes into my office and wants to tell me, like, because people vent, right? We just do that. They, we, we vent, and, 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 and people in my office feel like I am a safe sounding board. So they like to come in and just vent everything. And so I'm just like, Lord, if people come, just let me give them the Word of God and send them on their way, right? Like, I'm trying so hard. And so, so I can't say that I was completely successful this week with not having to know some stuff. But I, I, I feel like the Lord really answered my prayers <coughs> most days this week. And what He showed me was that when I fall into... I need to know what's going on. When I fall into, well, who all was involved in this? When I fall into that, what I'm actually doing is, is trying to build my own kingdom. Like, I'm worried about Nikki's kingdom. How does this affect me? How do I need to respond? How do I need to do things differently for my job? You know what I'm saying? Like, it's my kingdom. I'm worried about my kingdom instead of worrying about the kingdom. Like, my focus shifts to, is this going to affect me? Like, how is this going to make me look? If I respond this way, you know what I'm saying. You all have been there, right? Like, you've all been there. And I'm building my own kingdom. And what God has shown me this week is that when I pause, like, I stopped a lady. And this is huge for me because she was just spewing information. And I'm like, hey, I really just need to stop you right there. Like, First of all, I can't do anything about your problem. Like, I don't have the authority to fix any of this for you. So let me just direct you to somebody who can. Let me just send you down the, down the hall to an administrator. Like, you just need to go down there and talk, you know. And she's like, well, I'm not really making a complaint. I just really just want to vent. I just need somebody to talk to. Like, I know, and I get it. But just go down the hall. So in that moment, I felt like I put a brick in the kingdom. Like that was a victory in, in, for the kingdom because had I let her continue, oh, I would have gathered information that possibly I could have used in the future to establish my own kingdom. But what good would that do for the kingdom of heaven? Absolutely nothing. God has put me, has put you in a unique position, in a unique place for a unique purpose. I do not work at Waller ISD Transportation just to earn a paycheck. I am there on mission. You are where you are at, Denise, on mission. On mission, Holly. On mission, Paul. Carrie, Doug, Haley, everybody in here. You are on mission. You were set in a particular place with your particular attitude, mindsets, and abilities to build the kingdom of God and not build your own. So I want to encourage you as you go about your week this week, if this is a struggle for you, 
If you are building your own kingdom, tear it down. Take a sledgehammer and knock it down. Because in the end, the walls will fall on you if you continue to build your own kingdom. But if you start putting bricks in the kingdom of heaven, building on the cornerstone that is Jesus Christ, there are rewards for you, sisters and brothers. There are rewards for you in heaven. There are even rewards for you in this life. To see the fruit. To see the fruit of building the kingdom of heaven. Do you know how different my workplace would be if I continually put stones in the kingdom of heaven and stop building my own kingdom? What a difference there would be in my workplace, in the attitudes. Oh, wow. I want to just encourage you this week. Don't have to know things. Ask God. Say, God, just, just let me know what you want me to know. I don't need to know anything else. Let my ears be closed to the things of this world and open to the things of heaven. Let me only receive the things that you have for me and reject the things of this world because that leads to death and your words lead to life. So I encourage you, if that's you this week, you can do it with his help. The power of the Holy Spirit in you will take you to a different place and will allow you to build the kingdom of heaven and tear down your walls. Pray with me, please. Father God, we thank you so much for this day, for your word, for your people. Father God, we pray that you would come and that you would indwell our praises this morning as we lift up our voices in song. I pray that the lyrics that we sing would not just be words that we are repeating mindlessly, but that they would be a prayer and a praise straight from our heart to yours. Father, your word tells us that you keep our tears in golden bowls, that they mean that much to you. So for everyone here who is hurting and broken, Father God, assure them this morning that their tears are not in vain. Father, I pray that you would help us to destroy our own kingdom and build yours. Father God, I pray that you would make us a people who love, who are marked by your love so that we may love others. I pray that we would be a people who share the gospel with love and grace and mercy. That we would be a magnet that draws people closer to you. Father, help us today where we fall short. Forgive us, Father God, where we have failed you. Father, we know your grace and forgiveness is there for the asking. So, Father, we ask for it now. And Father, we pray for Pastor as he comes to deliver the message that you have put on his heart for us, that you would anoint him, Father God, with power and purpose to share the word boldly. Father, I pray that we would accept it into our hearts and that we would not just hear it, but we would, we would act on it, that we would not just be hearers of the word, but that we would be doers of the word. Father, help us to walk it out every day. Father, help us to not hear it on Sunday and forget it on Monday. Father, help us, strengthen us, lead us, guide us. Father God, you have been so good to us. Help us to have gratitude for the things, Father God, that you have done in us and through us, for us. Father God, we thank you for it. Let us not grow weary of giving thanks to you, Father God. Father, we love you, we praise you, and it's in the strong name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. By myself today, so you guys are going to have to sing extra loud. <laughs> you don't want that. Because <laughs> I would be hopeless without your goodness. I would be desperate.
something of such great importance uh, to those children and the other children that will in, in the future be impacted by that ministry. So just continue to pray um, and also pray about what God wants you to do in, in regards to being involved in that, uh, in that mission, okay? Amen. Let's go ahead and dismiss our children next door for Children's Church. Bye-bye. See you. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all sound way too eager to dismiss them this morning. Okay? It's been a rough morning with all the children's. <laughs> Is she okay? No, I should be okay. Alright, while they're walking out of the building, let's go ahead. I'm going to have you guys turn in your Bibles this morning to 1 Peter chapter 5. Alright? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read some verses from Joshua chapter, uh, well, chapter 5 and also in chapter 6 just to kind of bring us up to speed of, of you know, where we're at in the book of Joshua and what we're talking about. Uh, last week we looked at the story of Rahab, all right, the Rahab the prostitute who hid the spies uh, that were sent over um, into Canaan from Israel to spy out the territory to see, you know, what Jericho was all about. And uh, it, it tells us that, you know, that Rahab, right, that she, that she had a fear for God. Okay. We talked about what it is to, to be justified before God, what justification is. Um, you know, that we are justified, we, we learn, right, that we're justified by our faith and not by our works. But yet, James says in, 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 his, in, in the Gospel of James, not the Gospel, but the Epistle of James, that we are justified not by works only, but by faith. I mean, by faith only, but by works also. And when he's speaking specifically about Rahab and her story, and you, but the Apostle Paul tells us that we're justified by faith, right? So who's right and who's wrong? Well, they're both right, right? Because what Paul is saying, right, justification in regards to our salvation before God, we're justified by grace through faith. That's how we are saved, and we're positionally right with God because of what Christ has done for us in placing our faith in His finished accomplished work. What James was saying is that true faith, a true faith that saves is a faith that is demonstrated. It is shown by what we do. And, and in the same way, you know, James says of himself, he says, you show me your works by what, you tell me you have works, but I'll show you my works by what I do. Alright? Works follows salvation. And that's why the Apostle Paul in, in, in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 says that we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that He has planned beforehand that we should walk in them. All right? So we're justified by faith. But church, it takes faith. <laughs> Demonstrated faith. Faith that is active in obedience to God and following the will and the purpose and the plan of God. Well, today we're going to talk about recognizing... God's authority in our life, okay, submitting to that authority, and also humbly obeying it, okay? Uh, so I want to read to you just a few passages here before we jump over to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 5. Uh, first, I want to read to you, and Nick will have it up here on the screen, but in Joshua, in the book of Joshua in chapter 5, in verses 13, 14, and 15, now see... They're just now getting ready to, uh, to cross over the Jordan and enter to the land of Canaan. And in this, in, this, um, in this moment, it says here in verse 13, it says, And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, so they've passed over the Jordan now, and it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our, our adversaries? So he said, No, but, a, I, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord uh, say to his servant? 
Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take your sandal off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. Now, most commentaries that, 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 that you would read would recognize that this is in fact the incarnate God, Jesus Christ Himself, in the Old Testament. And that's, the, that's, the, that's what I hold to. Now, we know that Jesus, all right, He didn't just come on the scene right at Bethlehem, right? Jesus didn't just appear at Bethlehem. He wasn't just you know, this created thing, right? And because He is eternal God, at least that's what the Word teaches us, right? We all believe that here this morning, right? That Jesus Christ is eternal God. That means that He is He's not created, okay? And what we see here is we see this picture, this imagery of Christ in, 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 in the Old Testament. And here... We see that, first of all, Joshua has to recognize, right, that this is the commander of the Lord's army before me. He recognizes the authority that's been given to him, but then he submits to that authority whenever he humbles himself and bows down and worships this authority. And then it says in verse 15, right, and Joshua did so. In other words, he obeyed that authority. Church is still the same requirement is required of us today in regards to our worship to the Lord. Is that we recognize that He is our ultimate authority, that we submit to that more authority, meaning that we place ourselves underneath His Lordship, His leadership, and then we obey that authority in our life. Okay? Now I want to just read a few more passages here in Joshua, beginning with chapter 6 and verse 1. It says, Now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all you men of war. You shall go all around the city once. This you, should, this you, you shall do six days. And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets and ram's horns before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priest shall blow the trumpets. It shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout. Then the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, every man straight before him. Then Joshua the son of Nun called the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant, and let seven priests bear seven trumpets and ram's horns before the ark of the Lord. And he said to the people, Proceed and march around the city, and let him who is armed advance before the ark of the Lord. Then we see the result of what God has instructed them to do through their obedience is over in, in verse 20. It says, So the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets, and it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat. Then the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. I want to bring us your attention back to what their instruction was. Okay? The commander of God's host, his army, spoke to Joshua and said, Joshua, I want you to gather the people. I want you to march around the city for six days. Once, once a day for six days. And on the seventh day, I want you to have seven priests with seven horns to march around the city seven times with the people. And on the seventh time, to give out a shout and the walls of Jericho would come down. Can I? Let me ask you a question. Do you think that they would have the same result if they had left out one step? Do you think that they would have the same result if they got to the sixth day and they got tired of marching and kind of tired of waiting on God and decided you know, they're going to go get their chisels and their hammers and they're going to start beating away at that wall? Do you think they would have the same result that they had had they not been obedient to God's command? If they Had they not been obedient to what God's instruction for them? No. You see, they would still be chipping away at that, at that wall piece by piece by piece by piece. Because instead of being obedient to God, instead of recognizing God's authority in their life, and instead of 
you know, submitting to that authority, and instead of obeying that authority, they decided to take matters in their own hands and do it their own way, expecting to get the same result as they would if they had just obeyed God, the results would have not been the same. And I tell you, church, that that is applicable in our lives today as well. That when we, don't, when we fail to recognize the authority of God in our life, when we reckon and fail to submit to that authority, right? When we just, you know, do things our own way, even though God has given us clear instruction through His Word, right, about what is morally right and what is morally wrong. He's given us clear instruction on how we are to, to put our faith and our trust in Him, but yet many times we fail on that, right? And we find ourselves in circumstances and situations where we lost all hope. And we decide we're just going to take matters in our own, hand, in our own hands and we take out our hammer and our chisel and we try all that we can to chisel away that wall, right? Piece by piece by piece by piece. And eventually, we're just so worn out, we just throw down a hammer and we think, man, that wall's going to be in my life for the rest of my life. What do I do? Now, I got good news for us today, church, is that listen, that God can tear that wall down. But don't leave out one step. Not one step. Let's turn to second, I mean first Peter in chapter five. Let me know when you get there. You there already? Yeah. I see y'all are listening. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Here in verse five, Peter says. Likewise, you young people, submit yourselves to your elders. And all the adults said, Amen, Amen right? <laughs> but then he also adds to that, yes, all you be submissive. Okay, now he's not just addressing the young, he's addressing all of us. And he says, submissive to who? To one another. And be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. You know, I was, uh, I was thinking about this idea of authority and submitting to authority and obeying authority. Evelyn had uh, sent us all a video this week of a fight that broke out in her school. And, uh, you know, when I was in school, we may have had a fight, but it was between me, you know, one person and another person. But it was like the whole school got involved, it looked like, man. It was just this great mob of people, just 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 complete chaos. And you know, you could see in this in this video, man, you know, the police officer on, on that was there, you know, trying to just get it all under control. And man, these kids just totally ignoring. You know, his, his authority in that situation and, and the principal was brought down to the ground almost because he was trying to inter intervene. And, and I thought to myself, man, what, what has happened to our respect for authority? And I know it's easy to look at this generation and say, man, <laughs> it's this generation, but no. You see, authority, the, the rebellion against authority. Let me ask you a question. Let me just be personal with you this morning. Have you ever rebelled? Never. I didn't hear from all of y'all, and I know that all of y'all were once a teenager, okay? Yeah. If you can show me a teenager that has not been rebellious at some point in their life, you need to turn that, that child over to sci scientific study or something because... Rebellion is bound up in the heart of man. That's what the Bible teaches us. It's bound up within the heart of the man of man. Listen, they're just acting in their own nature. But church, there has to be a recognition if we are followers of Jesus Christ of, of proper authority and a submissiveness to that authority in our life. Otherwise, you're just going to continue to fight against God, not with God. And that's why the Bible says here in, in 1 Peter that God resists the proud. That literally means, church, it literally means that He sets Himself against it. It's not that He just turns away from it. He's like, no, get it out of your life. Because pride is destructive. Pride takes us away 
from, from a close, intimate fellowship relationship with God because what we do is we put self above God. That's what pride is. He resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. You see, humility, church, is, is what is needed in our life. Humility, church, is not pride. It's opposite of pride. It's a humble submission to God, a recognition that He is Lord, and we're not. So often, we want to take up that chisel and that hammer and beat at that wall the best we can. Can I tell you, and I know you don't have to tell me, you have your own walls in your own life. You do. I do too. But there's got to be a place where you recognize that, listen, you're tired of swinging that hammer and that chisel and you're not getting anywhere with it. Maybe instead of doing it your way, you should do it God's way. Maybe you should drop the hammer. And you should recognize that God is the ultimate authority in your life and that you need to submit to Him and do it His way. You know, the biggest struggle, I think, with humankind is that we, we keep continuing to, to seek to be our own God in our own life. Seeking our own way, doing things our own way, because listen, that rebellion is bound up in the heart of man. It's not just this generation. Many of us are struggling with it today. On a very personal way. And what God is looking for from us, if we're going to see that wall be torn down in our lives, it's through humble submission. It's recognizing that He has the authority in our life. And hey, listen, it's submitting to that authority. In other words, you're saying, hey, God, yes, I want it your way. But then it's through humble obedience to God. It's through humble obedience to God. In church, in verse 6, it says, Therefore, humble yourselves. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time. That word exalt means to lift up. Okay? And when we humble ourselves under His mighty hand, right? we're not resting in our own strength, our own power. We've been looking a lot at that, right? Because that is the very thing that we see that Israel had to do in order to conquer the, Canaan, the, the, the inhabitants of the promised land is that they had to recognize and put their place and their faith and their trust and find their strength in God. Not themselves, not their abilities and what they can and cannot accomplish, but to put their faith and their trust in a God who is able, who has demonstrated His faithfulness, His power, His might, time and time again for Israel. And church, I want, to, I want us to remember... That God has demonstrated that, that same power on our behalf. If you're born again, follower of Jesus Christ, Jesus, God says that, listen, that yet while we, He demonstrated His love towards us, yet while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know what that means? That while you were at your worst, God sent His Son. And Jesus, through His death, His burial, and His resurrection, broke the power of sin and death over our lives. And therefore, church, we are purchased, redeemed. We can stand before a holy God uncondemned like it tells us in Romans 12. That's by the power of God. If you're a child of God, you're not a child of God because you have chiseled hard enough at that wall, but because you've submitted to the gospel of Jesus Christ, the power of God unto salvation for anyone who would believe. It's the power of God. He says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. And He says, and He will exalt you in, in what? Due time. And there's the, those are the key words right there. Due time. What does that mean? His time. Right? See, many of us struggle with that, don't we? Let's be honest. You don't have to raise your hand. I ain't going to call you out like that. I'll say it. I'll fess up. I struggle with that sometimes. You know, when you've been chiseling away at that wall for so long, and you're like, God help me, God help me, but you still won't put the hammer down, right? And you're still waiting for God to show up, and it just doesn't seem like He's doing anything. Listen, it's not because He's not doing something. It's because He is doing something. And maybe 
Maybe you just have to stay in that for a little while longer until you learn it, right? Because the Bible tells us, listen, no, no, <clears throat> no suffering in our life, no hardship goes without purpose for us. That very hardship, that very tribulation that we may be facing here today is working within us a greater good. Shaping us, molding us. Doing like what Peter says in the beginning of 1 Peter when he says that listening, the, the testing of our faith is like gold being refined in fire. Gold has to be placed in, in extreme heat in order to melt away all the dross, all the impurities until what is left is something of value and worth. In the same way, church, sometimes... Sometimes we have to submit to the authority of God and be willing to say, God, even in this, I trust You. Even in this, church, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put my faith in You and I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait until You move in this situation. But He is clear that He will exalt you. He will lift you up in due time. And He says here in verse 7, casting all your care upon Him. For He cares for you. The God who has full authority over all creation, He is sovereign God, holy. Set apart from all creation, there is no other God except for Yahweh. Okay? He is God, and that God says through Peter, He cares for you. Aren't you thankful for that this morning? Amen. Are you thankful that, listen, God has not turned a blind eye to you and your situation right now and what you may be facing and going through? No, in fact, He beckons us to come to Him. Jesus says, come to Me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus says, come. Peter says, cast your cares on Him because He cares for you. That should bring us some comfort this morning, church. To know that, listen, we don't serve a God who turns a blind eye to our need. He doesn't turn a blind eye to our situation. But He looks upon us with compassion. And He, and he, and he desires us to come, come and to cast our cares upon Him. I want to read to you part of this commentary that, that I read this morning. And He will quote Charles Spurgeon here also. But it says the work of casting can be so difficult that we need to use two hands to do it. The hand of prayer and the hand of faith. Quoting Charles Spurgeon, he says, prayer tells God what the care is and asks God to help. While faith believes that God can and will do it. Prayer spreads the letter of trouble and grief before the Lord and, and opens up its budget. And then faith cries, I believe that God cares and cares for me. I believe that He will bring me out of my distress and make it promote His own glory. Faith and prayer. You know, the Apostle Paul tells us in Philippians 4 that we are to cast our cares upon Him. I mean, that we're that we to be anxious for nothing, but in all things, he says, through prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, that we are to make our requests be made known to God, and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. To be anxious means, listen, don't worry. <laughs> any, do I have any worry works in here this morning? <laughs> Nick, I tell you, man, I'm a problem. That's me. We talked about this in men's breakfast yesterday about what the Apostle Paul meant when he says, I've learned to be content in all things in Philippians 4. He says, I've learned contentment because contentment, church, is something that is learned because we learn and we see the faithfulness of God in all circumstances and situations and recognize that He really is sovereign. He really is in control. You see, Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, not... Speaking of winning a ball game, but speaking of winning in life, putting faith in God, in the hard and in the good, 
all circumstances, learning that he can do all things through Christ who strengthens him. Having not a, a self-dependence, but a dependence on God. Ultimately, church, that's, our, that's where our victory is found. And we recognize that He has the authority over our lives. We submit to that authority and we obey that authority. We recognize that God has a greater good and a greater plan. That He does care for us. And that He does what He says He's going to do when, he, when, when the Apostle Paul says it, that He works all things out for the good of those who love Him and are called according to His, to his purpose. In verse 8, and I, I just want to make mention of this. You see, in hardship, we have a, it, 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 we have a choice to make. Okay, We have this pivotal point where we can we can let the hardship overcome us, right? We can fall off to the wayside. Or we can put our faith and our trust in God and let Him be the rock for which we stand upon in those hardships and those difficult times. And let Him carry us. Because, listen, church, there is a very real and present enemy out there who desires nothing more but to steal, kill, and destroy. And that's why the Apostle Paul, I mean, Peter says here in verse 8, he says, Be sober. Be vigilant because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. To be sober and to be vigilant means that we are to have a, be clear-headed. It means that we are to be watchful. Alright? Be aware. Not blind. But to be aware. He says because our adversary the devil roams around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Can I tell you, church, we're most vulnerable to his tactics when we're not walking in faith and obedience to God. When we're not walking in the light as he is in the light. That's when we're most vulnerable to his tactics, to his schemes, to his lies, to his deception most vulnerable when we have stepped out of the covering of God in regards to our, 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 our um, protection and our, our blessings in the sense of, you know, we're not submitting to God, therefore we're not walking with Him in faithfulness and obedience, so, but yet we still want all the benefits and the rewards as if we were, right? But he tells us how that we are to stand against him here in verse 9. It says, resist him. In other words, stand against him. How? With your strength and with your might? No. He says, resist him steadfast in the faith. Knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But then he says, but may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by, Jesus, by Christ Jesus after you have suffered a while. He didn't say... You know, see, the Bible doesn't tell us that we will be spared suffering, right? There's no promise in the Scripture that tells us that. You know, and that's the misconception I think that a lot of believers... I mean, a lot of people have when they come into, the, in, into faith in Christ is they think, man, everything's just going to be made right and better now and everything's going to be good from here on out. But yet, Jesus gave us a warning. Speaking to His disciples when He says, in this life you will have tribulation. But He says, but be a good cheer for I have overcome the world. You see, our victory is in Christ. And, and listen, often there's certain things we're not going to see that victory until we enter into glory and we enter into the internal inheritance that awaits us in heaven. But listen, we're, that's why the Bible says it states so often that we're to be steadfast in the faith, that we are to, you know, that we're to persevere in hardship and trial. And the only way that we do that is by keeping our eyes on the author and the finisher of our faith, keeping it on Jesus Christ, looking to Him, following Him. And church, I think that so often we get so wrapped up, man, in the do's and don'ts that we forget that the one who gives us 
All that we need is enough. And He's Christ Jesus. And it's not so much about a list of things to do. It's about who you know. It's about the relationship that God beckons us into through Jesus Christ. And that we can have fellowship with Him and to know Him intimately. Church, you cannot know Him on a deeper, more personal level if you find yourself continually resisting Him by having pride in your life. By taking up that chisel and that hammer and trying to beat at that wall yourself. No. The way that we, that we grow in that fellowship and that intimacy with Christ is through continued submission in our life. Laying ourselves down, taking up our cross and following Him. And those walls of Jericho would have never come down for Israel if they would have stopped midway. If they would have decided, well, maybe God's not sufficient enough. And decided they could do it themselves. And I have seen time and time again, I know people personally in my life, that I care deeply about. Who have come to church. They have prayed that God would take a certain, certain situation out of their life, a certain thing that is, you know, that wall in their life, that wall of Jericho in their life. And, 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 God, and you know, God doesn't just automatically, quickly just move it out of their life. And, and they lose all hope. And before you know it, man, they're not even seeking anymore. I can tell you that God wants to tear down some walls in your life. And He is, what it requires is us putting our faith, our trust in Him, and obeying Him, following Him, doing it His way. In verse 10 it says, But may the God of all grace, aren't you thankful for grace this morning? Who called us to His eternal glory by Christ Jesus after you have suffered a while perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle. And that is the purpose of trials. Paul would say it's to build our character. To perfect us, to establish us, to strengthen us, and to settle us. Where they say that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger? There's some truth to that in regards to our suffering. But listen, it's not that we become so strong in ourselves, but so we become stronger in faith, recognizing that God, God is the answer to this. Putting my faith and my, my trust in Him, that's the answer to this. If I want to see that wall come down in my life, then i got to put down the hammer and i got to trust God. And I'm, not, I'm not saying that there's no requirement of us. The requirement is faithfulness, obedience to God. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll obey me. And we're to follow after the Lord and to, and to submit to His authority in our life. To Him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Church, we have to recognize God's authority in our life. We have to submit to that authority. And we have to humbly obey His authority. I'd be willing to bet that there's many of us here today who are resisting Him right now. There's something in your life right now that you know that the Lord is saying, it's not, it's not my best for you. That's not what I want for you. Some of y'all have already put a wall in between you and Him because you, just, you, don't, you don't see a life apart from that. What God wants you to do is say yes to Him, no to that, and then let Him restore all that the enemy has torn away from you. Would you please stand this morning?
day in and day out. And submit yourself to God and His Lordship in your life. And be willing to humbly obey Him and say yes to Him. You know, the Apostle John says in 1 John in chapter 1 that if we can confess our sins to Him, He's faithful, He's just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I've explained that time and time again. That confession is coming in agreement with God. Not resisting Him. Not trying to convince Him He's wrong and you're right. Confession is you recognize that He's right, you're wrong. And you bring it before Him in prayer. And the Bible says He's faithful. He's just to forgive you and to cleanse you of your unrighteousness. Amen? Invitations open this morning. If you're tired of resisting and you're ready, you're ready to submit, I want to impact and you come. Do it today. Don't wait. Altar's open. I'll be here over here for prayer. If you need me to pray with you this morning, please come. But don't walk out these doors not having responded to God if He is speaking to you this morning in any way. Would you please come? My worth is not in what I am, not in the strength of flesh and bone, or in the costly wounds of love. Not in skill or name, it's in win or lose or pride or shame. Or in the blood of Christ that flows and flows.
may be seated.